Hello. <clears throat> I have no idea of how this camera angle looks right now, but hello, welcome to um, Sovereign Artsakh, but the um, Sogolman Tellurian Prison Diary series. Uh, I'm going to read, man, this guy's writing continues to impress me. Let me move this a little closer. Uh, I'm going to be reading what's probably one of the single most engrossing impassioned passages that he has written. Well, his memoir is full of it, full of that, this, that kind of writing. But this, this is on April 11th, 1921, 100 years ago this past April. And as a reminder to those of you that are watching this as I post these videos, that we're only a, a week away from his trial. So a hundred years ago today, he was one week away from facing his accusers, if you will. <clears throat> now, uh, this is also only four days. It's the fourth day after he's received paper, right? He's been in prison for a month. And then on April 8th, he received paper to write with, paper and pencil. And so on the first day, he just wrote and wrote and wrote to catch up all those, that month prior and essentially has an entry for each day. So on April 8th, he, he wrote uh, material recounting each day of his in imprisonment since, um, since March 15th. And then on April 9th, the second day he had paper available, he wrote a love poem to the girl he loves. On the third day, on April 10th, he wrote a I don't know if you call it a hate poem or a death poem, but he wrote another a poem, and I've, I've read them, so you can go back to the other episodes. Um, he read a, a poem, or wrote a poem to the man he just killed. And then here we are on April 11th. So this is the fourth day that he's had paper in his hands. And let me read, let me just read. It's a, it's a longer entry than some, but I'm going to read it all. My two defense lawyers come visit me before noon to obtain detailed information about my initial interrogations. They're accompanied by an Armenian man who is, who is to act as our interpreter. I had a premonition in the morning. I had a premonition in the morning that I would have visitors today. And I have been impatiently waiting for my attorneys with hopes of receiving important news about my trial, including the date it was to start on. I am in high spirits as I go into the visiting room, but when I see the seriousness on the faces of my attorneys, as well as the solemn and brooding expression on the interpreter's face, my mood sours at once, and I feel a shudder go down my spine. We are talking. We start talking. Whereas I expect them to tell me approximately how long of a prison sentence I, uh, how long of a prison sentence could await me, and even hope to hear from them that I might probably be acquitted. I gather that actually they're not even sure I would be spared the death sentence, although, although they don't say this in so many words. Oh, I am horrified whenever I think of the words death sentence. Later, however, after I take my leave and am alone again in my cell, my sense of dread begins to ease. I've been in prison for almost a month now. I've been happy and content throughout this time notwithstanding certain moments of sadness, which, of course, are not unusual in the lives of people on the outside either. Also, during this time, I have been convinced that if, at worst, I receive a prison sentence, the fact is that I am already behind bars and have been feeling happier than ever, and presumably the days of, of the remainder of my imprisonment would be spiced with the same happiness until death reaches me. Such has been my reasoning ever since being locked up. So far, prison has had a uh, so far prison has never had a significant impact on my mental state in terms of driving me to fear or despair. <clears throat> Today, however, a sea change has occurred before my very eyes. Death sentence. When as a human being, as a living part of nature and as a young soul yearning to live life and partake of its joys, I see myself face to face with death, which with its fangs deployed, is ready to shackle me and forever remove me from the glories of this world. Ah, at that moment, the terror of death shakes my whole being, and I, as someone who once and for all will say farewell to this world, 
see the horrendous abyss that has opened in front of me, an abyss into which I will fall, never to come out of it? Yet suddenly the question, why, materializes before my eyes amid these thoughts, and every letter of that why seems to be a human being who wishes to console me, to tell me it is in that very horrific abyss that my happiness awaits me, and it is there that my new life will begin. Death. But why? Because I've seen tens of thousands of mothers being put to the sword with the lament of mourning for their children upon their lips. Because I've seen tens of thousands of children being bayoneted and the Euphrates and the Tigris being painted with the blood of the cadavers of the innocent. And because, after having seen all this, I've wanted to hear the voice of revenge emanating from the wandering, scattered, unburied bones of two million innocent martyrs, and, by heeding that voice, to hearten the remnants of my Armenian people. It's why death, after all this, would be a joy for me, as I am certain that the unknown graves of my loved ones and the sacred bones of all the martyrs of my people will cease to sob thus being able to rest forever in peace, knowing that no longer alive was the human-like fiend whose monstrous plan they were the innocent victims of. And I am blissfully ready to welcome my death, for I would be taking the sacred good news to all my martyred souls, saying to them, I was glad to die after having justly avenged you all. Holy crap. <laughs> There's a term, and it's the term fedayin, or fedayi is the singular. Fedayin is the plural. Fedayi is the singular. And it translates to those who sacrifice or he who sacrifices is the singular. <clears throat> but it's used of terrorists. It's used of those who lay down their lives for their cause. But it, it it's not exclusive to terrorism. It's this Sogomon Tolerian is a fedai. He who sacrifices. He's like, okay, death, okay. It was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Um, and I, my last comment. I mean, this text speaks for itself, but my last comment is uh, he talks here about how he's been happy in prison. You have to keep in mind for six years, he was tormented to his core, not knowing what happened to his mother, knowing that they had been massacred, but not knowing, not being able to have closure, not seeing her grave. And then she appears to him. So he has been a tortured and tormented soul for six years. And the moment he gets release and freedom from that torture, he's thrown in prison. But the prison walls are nothing compared to the, the prison that he was in before that. So it's, it's this amazing juxtaposition. He's like happy-go-lucky in prison. He's like, oh, this has been nice. I've accomplished my task and now I'm safe and secure. I get fed and... You know, now I can think about the world. What is it? Maybe I will go free and be able to enjoy the life. I'm still young and enjoy this life. But if I have to die, then that will be joy as well. All right. Um, tune in tomorrow.